Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor in ECE here at the University of Washington. And today we have the, the pleasure of having Professor Sairaj Doble from the University of Minnesota, who is gonna be giving us a talk today with this very lofty title, Power Flow Through the Ages. So I, I, I looked at his abstract and I think we're gonna get a nice little history lesson and it should hopefully be quite accessible to uh, the broad audience here. So anyway, just uh, get comfortable and enjoy the ride. So let me just give a little bit of background about uh, Sairaj. So he obtained his, um, all of his degrees and PhD from uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His degrees are in electrical and computer engineering. He's currently an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, and his research interests include uh, modeling, analysis, and control of power systems, and he has a uh, emphasis on inverter-based renewable sources. Um, he is distinguished by getting a career award from the National Science Foundation. And he also very recently uh, obtained the Outstanding Young Engineer Award from the IEEE Power and Energy Society. Um, he's also an editor for the IEEE Transactions on Energy Conversion and IEEE Transactions on Power Systems. So let's welcome Sairaj. And Sairaj, I'll let you Take it from here. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for uh, the introduction and, uh, and, and setting this up. Um, I don't know if my voice comes through OK. Is it is it loud and clear? All right. OK, so uh, this this talk is going to be part of uh, partly a history. Uh, I wouldn't say a lesson, uh, but partly a historical account of uh, how the electrical power system as we have it today came into being uh, and, and partly um, uh, interleave with this problem called the power flow problem, which power systems engineers are very familiar with. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to give a brief introduction uh, about that as well. Um, if there's any questions, I'm very happy to, to take them along the way. So just, you know, I, I think you should, it, it seems to me that you can unmute yourself here. So just unmute yourself and, and just shout it out and I'll try to answer them. Uh, or I think there'll be plenty of time towards the end for, for questions as well. Um, all right, so what are we talking about? So we're gonna talk about power flow. I'll give you a little bit of the historical account, uh, but let's let's start with the basics, right? And the basics is really your freshman semester circuits course. Um, and, and, and over here, what, what, what is the first thing that we try to impress upon students is, you know, in electrical engineering, whether you're looking at small wires or big wires, for the most part, we think about networks, uh, which might be composed of uh, linear circuit elements. Uh, and these networks typically are connected, right? So there's no islands. Uh, we'll, we'll make our life a little bit easy for us. Uh, and things get much more interesting when there's dynamics involved, but let's focus on sinusoidal steady state operation, right? So we can deal with phasers. So almost everything that I talk about today is going to be sinusoidal steady state. If it's not, I'll, I'll bring it up. Uh, and let's suppose these are fed by current injections. In a setup like this, uh, it's very easy to solve for the nodal voltages that appear at different nodes in this linear electrical network as a function of these current injections. And that linear map is essentially what we uh, all know is, is the so-called network admittance matrix or this matrix Y. So what we have here is a linear relationship between the voltages and currents. So these are all stacked up in some matrix vector form here. And we have I is Y times V. So that's, that's your freshman semester, right? And then we take different versions of this and we tailor it to different applications depending on whether you're looking at, 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 at small wires or big wires. Uh, and for all the people that, that are looking at big wires, we, we come to maybe a junior semester uh, course on power systems where we think about what this problem uh, means in the context of the bulk power system. So we still retain our assumptions of maybe a linear network, it's still connected still operating in sinusoidal steady state. Uh, but we take this one level higher and we say, all right, instead of having current injections that are constraints at these nodes in the network, we are going to take that one level up 
and we're going to think about the nodal constraints as being power constraints. Okay, what that means is that all these nodes you have either a fixed amount of uh, injected real and reactive power or a fixed amount of withdrawn real and reactive power. And we'll see why this problem makes sense for, for thinking about the bulk power system. But that's basically the, the, the setting that we introduce in uh, any undergraduate course in power systems. So what we have now is, unfortunately, since we are now living uh, with, with quadratic relationships between uh, voltage and current dictating the nodal constraints, the nodal voltages now become nonlinear functions of the power injections. So it's no longer I is equal to YB, uh, but now we have constraints on power at each of these nodes. And at each bus K or each node K in this network, we have constraints on real and reactive power uh, that appear in the form of these two equations that are shown below. So you still want to solve for the voltages. Okay, so these are the variables VK and VJ. Uh, we also want to solve for the angles that come alongside those voltages. So these are the phase angles uh, theta and uh, kj just means theta k minus theta j. Detail is not important. Uh, but really, we want to solve for the voltage magnitudes and phase angles in sinusoidal steady state. So these are all phasors. Given constraints on real and reactive power at each of these buses, and some information about the network, which now is encoded by these constructs b and g, uh, which are just susceptances and conductances that come about from uh, the linear nature of this network and entries of the admittance matrix Y that we had from the previous slide. So this is the classical formulation of the so-called power flow problem, uh, also called as the load flow problem and, and so on. So th th this is the problem that power systems engineers kind of tend to obsess about at a very basic level. And it turns out that this voltage information is very critical because we want to make sure that whenever you plug any device in, you have anything that's operating on the power system, you have some base level guarantees on the voltage magnitude. Uh, and, and it turns out that these phase angle differences are actually proportional to flows of real and reactive power across transmission lines. So we want to have regulation on the, uh, the, the phase angle differences as well. So for, for a bunch of these reasons, um, you know, expand, uh, 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 Going, going across a bunch of these applications such as situational awareness, you want to have dynamic simulations, control design, optimization algorithms. No matter what you do in uh, any application in power systems, whether it's at the transmission level or the distribution level, it turns out that having information about the voltages is important. Uh, and that's why this problem is key uh, to everything that we, that we think about and uh, in, in building up from, uh, from, from, from just solving the power flow up onto control design and optimization in, in, in the bulk power system. All right, so that's the power flow problem, right? You have a bunch of uh, nonlinear algebraic equations. They don't have um, an analytical closed form solution. A bunch of people have tried, they failed spectacularly, some not so much. Uh, but in any way, there's no closed form solution uh, that, that exists. So you throw it at some numerical algorithms uh, and, 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 and hope for the best. So we'll, we'll get back to this problem in a little bit. But I want to tell you uh, just a little bit about why we care about um, the, the, the particular formulation of this problem, right? So why is it that these nodes, for instance, have constant power uh, constraints? And the reason for that is the work cause today in the power system is the synchronous generator. Okay? Uh, it's a humble device um, uh, made up of massive amounts of rotating iron and steel. It's converting thermal energy to electrical energy. Uh, so there's a lot of um, fossil fuels that are burned here. Uh, and, and you have clean electrons uh, flowing on, on the terminals of this. And really, if you look at the power system, and that's really an interconnected network of transmission lines crisscrossing uh, the United States transmission grid at different voltage levels, what's at each of these nodes are these synchronous generators. And the way they are controlled in sinusoidal steady state that present themselves as these constant power injections. Um, so that's why we, 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 we formulate the problem of solving for voltages also in that, in that particular manner. Now, the transmission system that's shown here today, it's important to remember that this is a, a very complex system to, to operate and uh, to, to, uh, to dispatch. Um, and it's been recognized by the National Academy of Engineering to be one of the greatest engineering achievements, uh, top of the list actually in the 20th century. Um, and of relevance uh, in, to, to, to this particular talk also is what's happening on an operational side. Okay, and we'll see why that's going to be important. 
But it turns out that you know you just don't have these wires and you just kind of let the, 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 the whole system go, right? You need some amount of uh, some amount of, of, of regulation, you need some amount of oversight in terms of how these generators are going to be controlled. And that's provided by different system operators across uh, across the grid. And, and here are the key players uh, and across the United States grid. For you folks up Northwest, it's BPA. For us, it's MISO. So these regulatory agencies, these are nonprofits, they are uh, essentially op uh, uh, operating the, 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 the markets and they're dispatching the generators. They're making sure that there's an entire architecture in place uh, in order to regulate the operation of these generators in, in real time, okay? And, and we'll get to get to what this all means in the next couple of slides. So in order to do that, what I wanna uh, spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about is how the grid works across time and how it works across space. So here's the temporal picture. Uh, what we have on the very left is the generators with their dynamics. There's a lot that's going on even faster than, than 60 Hertz, but we'll not really bother about that for the purpose of this conversation. Remember, we are basically focused on sinusoidal steady state operation, as I, as I hinted at at the very beginning. So there's these generators with their dynamics, um, you know, uh, but, but, but they, they do need some inputs in terms of telling them how much power to produce. And that's coming from two sets of operations. Uh, there's a control layer called as automatic generation control. And then there's a dispatch layer called as economic dispatch. So we'll, we'll start from the top uh, or we'll start from the right here and then we'll work our way uh, towards, towards the middle. Um, one picture to maybe keep in mind here as we discuss these things is to envision the economic dispatch as maybe planning a trip on Google Maps to think about automatic generation control as your cruise control on your car. And then your generator dynamics are just you know you on your on, on your vehicle cruising down the highway, right? So what economic dispatch does is it's it's done in a look ahead manner. Okay, so this is done with very minimal inputs collected uh, from what's actually happening um, on on the ground. So you try to minimize the cost of operating all the generators, and you do it subject to a set of constraints. And so this is an optimization problem, uh, and what that spits out are hopefully your planned trajectories, right? For the real power that you expect to generate from all the generators. As I said, this is done in a look ahead fashion. It's done with an estimate of the load, which is going to be outdated by the time you get close to real time operation. So what you need then is this uh, middle layer provided by automatic generation control. So this is a feedback control loop. It takes these dispatch set points and it collects frequencies from generators and it uses that to close the loop and suggest real-time uh, dispatch signals or regulation signals so that the frequency is always going to be maintained at 60 Hertz. So the, the, the combination of all of these things does two things. It allows you to operate the system uh, in real time at 60 Hertz, and it allows you to operate the system in an economically optimal fashion because the cost functions that appear in this optimization problem are essentially generator fuel cost curves. So you're trying to minimize the cost of generation across this bulk system, subject to satisfying load supply demand constraints, and you do it uh, alongside this layer of automatic generation control to get you close to real-time uh, guarantees on performance. So this is what is happening across time. And if we take a look at what this means from a spatial point of view, uh, here's the picture that, that comes about. Okay, so I'm just taking those operations and I'm just showing you that um, on, 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 a, on a spatial sort of footprint. Uh, and there's a lot of arrows here, there's a lot of details, uh, but we'll just focus in on, on some key variables of interest. So at the very bottom here, we have the physical layer. So these are generators shown as voltage sources, loads, which are shown as these arrows, and these are the nodes in the system. So these, these bars or these buses, and they're all interconnected. And as I said, they don't just exist by themselves. At the top layer, you have this economic dispatch. So we are solving an optimization problem. They're solving, we try to minimize the cost of generation. We have some estimate of the load. Okay, and this is done in a, in a, in a, in a rolling five to 10 minute horizon. So this estimate of the net load, which is gonna be the sum of both of these loads at the very bottom here is already outdated by the time you solve this problem, but that's fine. We solve this problem. We get these optimizers, but then these are not exactly the real power the, the generators are going to produce. You run them through this cruise control. You run this real-time uh, feedback control mechanism. 
it collects frequency measurements and it composes what are called as uh, ACE. It's the area control error. This is a catch all error term, which tells you the net amount of load that you have serviced in each of these, uh, in, in the physical layer as a result of that load estimate being already out of date. So at the end of the day, what you get is a way to nudge these dispatch optimizers close to where they have to be. And that's what's done with this middle layer. Yeah, and there's these, uh, there, there are a couple of feed forward gains here, these alpha terms, which we'll see become important. And this is just a way of allocating the net additional load that you haven't forecasted out across all the generators to zero out this area control error on an area by area level. So at the end of the day, what happens then is you're able to regulate frequencies to where they need to be. An added effect of this is you're also able to regulate flows on these key tie lines that go across control areas to what they have to be scheduled. Uh, and you are able to operate this system in um, an economically optimal fashion because you're solving an optimization problem uh, at, at, the, at the end of the day. And you are also able to regulate frequencies, right? So this is doing everything that you need to do to make sure that the, the frequency is what you expect it to be. So this architecture is called edit to change tie line bias control. That's that's a mouthful, uh, but it's it's just a technical catch-all term for everything that's going on behind the scenes. And we'll see how this architecture came to being and influencing the formulation of the simple power flow problem that I talked about uh, at, at the very beginning. All right, so we take all of these details, right? And we kind of, uh, you know, hide behind the rug and we go back to our power flow problem, right? Why are we solving this power flow problem? We are, we are, we are solving this nonlinear problem. We wanna get an idea for these voltages, but in order to solve it, we have to abstract away all of the details that I presented that's happening from an optimization and a controls point of view and kind of encapsulate all of that information into what I use as my generator real power injections. And it turns out that when you stack up enough number of these equations uh, and, and, and you, you care about the number of known variables versus the number of unknown variables, it turns out that you can only solve this problem if you leave the power output for one of the generators to be unspecified. And that's how it's done uh, at, at, at a very freshman uh, level of understanding, right? And there's many reasons why this, uh, this, this has to be done. One aspect is that the network losses are unknown. So even if you do specify the power injections at all of these, this, you are not gonna be able to meet the losses when you solve for the problem. And for, for a variety of other reasons, it turns out that you, you always pick out this one generator, you call it the so-called slack bus, you leave it unknown, and then it turns out you have enough information as unknowns to solve a collection of uh, these nonlinear algebraic equations bottom for the voltages across the network. Okay. And that's the mystical slack bus as, as we call it. All right, so that's the power flow problem. Uh, a a, a 30,000 foot view on what it means, why it's important, a brief view at the architecture of the grid in terms of its spatial and temporal setup and why we care about solving this, this particular problem. And of course, I've hidden a lot of details here, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of take that, we'll put it on the side and we'll now jump a little bit into the history. But before doing that, I am gonna to get to a technical piece towards the later half of this conversation. And that's a means to revisit this slack bus, the single sort of generator that you pick out in, in order to make the computations go through. And it turns out that you can come up with an architecture that goes just a little bit beyond that. And that architecture actually respects what's happening from the operational point of view. And it's called the so-called distributed slack bus formulation for the power flow. In that case, you are able to get to a means of specifying power injections for all the generators much, much closer to what they would be in practice. So you now stick a slack variable psi and these participation factors pi, and then you use these inputs as the real power injections in your power flow equations. So I recognize this is quite complicated, but we'll kind of build on this and we'll revisit this going forward. But just remember that the plain vanilla version of the power flow problem, you are forced to leave one generator as the slack bus that's gonna pick up all the losses, any load that you haven't uh, kind of accounted for. And just remember that the power flow problem at the end of the day is attempting 
to reflect all that's happening from an operations point of view across a time horizon going up to a few minutes and across a large spatial uh, 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 distances, capturing generators and loads uh, in, in, in these many different balancing areas as, as, we, as we pointed out. All right, so let's, let's jump into the history here, okay? So uh, th there's a way this, this system evolved and there's a way the, the, this particular power flow problem also evolved over the ages. And there's three key uh, sort of points in time that I'm, that I'm highlighting. Uh, up, up at the very top, and we'll take a look at what happened at each of these three instances. So there was something that happened in the 1940s, a very specific thing that happened in 56 and, and in 71. And we'll take a look at this evolution in the context of uh, the expansion of transmission lines across the United States. And what's shown at the bottom uh, are, are snapshots of the US transmission grid. And you see that back in the 1900s, at the very turn of the century, not as many interconnections, you can barely tell apart the transmission lines. And then, you know, people started building these interconnections out. And right around the 40s, we see an exponential increase, right? So going from the 40s to the, the 50s and then the 60s, you really kind of see this uh, effort to interconnect across this continental scale. And we'll see why that happened at that particular instant of time. And when the history books are written, parts of the picture become more popular than the others. And the parts that are more popular in the context of electrification are what happened before the 40s. Okay, so this is everything that happened after the 40s that's going to be of relevance for this particular conversation. But what happened before the 40s and you know, around that period of time is very well known to us. And these are the known faces. We know exactly who Westinghouse is, or maybe not exactly, but we've seen enough movies about Tesla and we've read enough books about Edison and the battles between them that we seem to know who these people are and how they have contributed uh, to electrification as we know it today. Um, and it's, it's popular enough to a point that both Sherlock Holmes and Spider-Man have appeared in a movie that's relating to the war of the currents, the war in AC versus DC, right? So this has been really hammered to us that, you know, these were the turning events that, that resulted in, in electrification. Well, there is a fascinating history that goes beyond that as well. Okay, and that goes on to interconnections. So while the contributions of, of Tesla and Edison cannot be understated by any means in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of electricity as, as we know and use it today, there's a lot that happened outside of them. And as a result of the efforts of a few other key gentlemen and a few other key players we have interconnected operation. And I wanna stress that term of interconnection because before what I'm going to present uh, in the next few slides, we did not really have interconnections. The architecture in place uh, that I showed you where you have this economic dispatch, automatic generation control, basically cruise control for the power system did not exist before the efforts of a few people. And one person that comes to mind in, 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 in all of this conversation is the gentleman picture here. I'm sure no one's uh, apart from maybe Daniel uh, and, 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 and the power systems folks here, even knows who this gentleman is. His name is Nathan, it was Nathan Cohn. He worked for 48 years in a company called Leeds and Northrop. They made automatic uh, control equipment for generators uh, and very highly decorated, right? Member of the US National Academy of Engineering, uh, was awarded the IEEE Edison Medal, which is one of the highest honors that you can get from the IEEE. In fact, I think it is the highest honor that you can get from the IEEE in 82. And he, I don't want to say single-handedly, but he did introduce this idea that we talked about today, the spatial architecture that I showed you a few slides back, where the system has this physical layer, but controlling that behind the scenes, you have this optimization and you have this automatic generation control. Well, that was mostly Nathan's efforts. Uh, he called it net interchange tie line bias control. And the first time this was tried out was actually in the 40s. And it was done for uh, a collection of utilities in the US Midwest, uh, in Iowa, Illinois, Kansas, and Missouri. So there were a bunch of utilities who saw the vision in this. They realized that they could not support and offer electricity reliably to all their customer base just by doing it themselves. So there had to be interconnections that, that spanned out uh, across, across a larger area. And they bought into this vision. And it so turns out that back in the day, you know, we, we, we can run MATLAB from our phones today. Back in the day, MATLAB didn't exist. You couldn't run simulations. And 
it turns out uh, that you know you couldn't even like formally sort of model this in, in, in a very sort of precise sort of state space manner, right? So Nathan's quotes on this topics are quite fascinating. Here's one that, that particularly stands out from a book. Uh, he says, and the first part of this may not be as important, he says there was relatively little control theory. Simulation as practiced in recent years was not available for control experimentation. So he offers this quote in, in, uh, in, in, at, at a much later date. But he goes on to say it was not, however, especially missed. Experimentation on the best of all simulators, power systems themselves, was feasible and was practiced. So the way they actually interconnected generators, the way they tried out this architecture, this cruise control for the bulk power system as we introduced it, was by actually experimenting on it. They closed the loop at times where there was less load, light load at night, and they, they tuned all the gains. They tried to figure out what worked, what did not work. This loop makes sense, that one doesn't. And that's actually how they built it out. And that's quite fascinating. Um, so that was Nathan in the 40s, late 40s. And this was what was happening on the ground, right? So industry recognized that you had to interconnect. They were making these interconnections. They were operating the system. Uh, and before the 40s, right? What's important to keep in mind is that there was limited attempts of this interconnected operation, right? So you would you would operate the system in these islands. Uh, each balancing area or each authority that had jurisdiction would have a few generators, a few loads. One generator would 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 pick up the slack, uh, and and that's how you would maintain the lights. And then it was only after the forties that you had multiple generators then regulating frequency across a much much a uh, broader and, and bigger uh, spatial footprint of, of the power system. And that's essentially what allowed this exponential increase in transmission lines across the US power system. Now, that was all that was going on on the industry side. What were the academics doing? It turns out that in 1956, okay, so this is a few years, maybe a decade or so after all of these attempts at interconnection, that the academics realized that, hey, you know, we are now looking at, uh, at, at, at at ways of operating this power system in a particular way. And we want to be able to leverage uh, uh, computer simulations and, and, and numerical methods in order to kind of go along with that. So it was only in 56, uh, and this is to the best of my understanding, that we had the first sort of documented evidence of this so-called power flow problem, where you have these nodal power injections imposed, you're trying to solve for voltages, and it's all kind of reflecting what's happening behind the scenes. And these are three column papers that don't really exist today. At the end of the day, uh, or at the end of these papers, you would have these fascinating sort of discussion sections where you could go in and, and, and see people who had no problems being named, offer comments about the paper, about the paper and, and there would be engaging technical discussions. And if you dig into this technical discussion in one of the, in this, in this first uh, paper on power flow, you get to a very interesting description of the so-called slack machine. So remember this classical plain vanilla power flow problem that I talked about, and I said, you only have enough uh, unknowns as equations if you leave the power injection at one of those buses to be undetermined. Well, it turns out that there was a good enough reason for that. And the reason for that was that it actually mirrored what happened before interconnections. So even this first attempt at formalizing the power flow problem, which appeared 10 years after the interconnections were in full swing, harkened back to a time where there were no interconnections. And here's what uh, one of the gentlemen had to say about the Slack machine or the Slack bus. He said, the Slack bus is the so-called regulating generator which controls frequency or tie line loading, cannot be scheduled until the difference in generation and load plus, lo plus loss is calculated, measured, or balanced by a frequency controller. The details here are, are maybe not as important, but the point to keep in mind here is that the formulation that appeared maybe a decade after interconnections happened still did not keep up with those uh, with those interconnections. It still looked back to a time where you would only have isolated uh, power systems and very limited interconnections between them, and a single generator would somehow be responsible for 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 uh, for meeting the, the 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 net load and the losses and and everything that wasn't accounted for in, uh, when you get got to real time. So even though, as, so, so just to kind of recap, so multiple generators were regulating frequency across balancing areas after the 40s, 
Um, but the formulations, as I said, still aligned with these control schemes, you would have a single generator picking up the slack. Okay, so this is, this is actually quite an easy way to operate the system. It's not terribly reliable. You do need interconnections. It's not straightforward to have one generator pick up all the slack. That's uh, precisely what, what prompted the interconnections, but the academic formulations somehow never kept, uh, kept in tow. All right, uh, then we jump forward to the 70s. And you have the gentleman, Fred Schweppe, who again, all the power systems engineers will, will immediately recognize. Uh, Schweppe is known for a lot of fundamental contributions in the power systems area. In fact, the, 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 the mechanisms that we have for pricing electricity can be traced back to some of the earliest works that he, that he had. Uh, and it turns out that much like uh, all the other fundamental problems in, in power systems, Fred Schweppe had something to say about the power flow as well. And in fact, he had something to say about the distributed slack bus or this idea of accounting for generation from all power system generators that I'll talk about in a few slides. And he had something to say about it. And when we did the research on this, we dug into the, the, the records, it turns out that he advised a student in the 70s. And this thesis appeared in 1971. It's not easy to find. Uh, and it says, new methods for load flow calculation without any spring bus. So even back in the 70s, and this was again, maybe around 30 years after industry had really moved on, there were a lot of interconnected operation. Fred was, was, was at least getting to the point that, look, we have to revisit this problem. And it's not actually that one generator is picking up all the slack. We have to think about this power flow problem and what it means when you don't have this idea of this slack bus. He called it the swing bus. That was another term that was thrown out uh, back in the day. And they, they, they attempted this. They attempted to, 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 to get this problem formulation to be aligned with industry practices. Uh, so even though, you know, uh, back when we first looked at this, we were looking at setups where a single generator was providing this frequency regulation to at least acknowledge that you have power from all generators contributing to this interconnected operation and, 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 and the means for trying to get this problem updated to industry practice. But even his early attempts at doing this were not terribly formalized, okay? So in fact, if you dig into the future work section of this master thesis, he said, or, or at least the, advise, uh, the advisee said, applications of these new methods are suggested to tie line control and economic dispatch of a power system. So this is from the future work section. So they recognize that there is a need to reflect what happens from an operational side of things in terms of formulating this problem and getting it as closely aligned with industry practices as you possibly could. Uh, but again, it was sort of uh, 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 marshaled into in, into the into the future work section. Okay, so so we picked this up and and we recently were able to formalize this. So I'm going to now take a pause from the historical account and and jump into uh, let's say the, the core technical piece of this and and try to give you an idea for how do you actually formulate this uh, distributed slack bus version of the power flow problem. So we go back to this picture. You're trying to acknowledge injections from all the generators, uh, and you're trying to meet the slack variable, this variable psi, which is not entirely known. These are all the loads, all the losses, everything that you were unable to kind of predict in a look-ahead fashion. And you want to kind of allocate that to all the generators in the system, recognizing that when you interconnect, all the generators are going to contribute. All of them are going to pump real power into the system. All of them are going to be responsible across the continental scale to some extent to keeping the lights on in any particular uh, in individual establishment. And that's done through these participation factors, these variables phi, in this case, there's four of them since there's four generators, okay? So that's a distributed slack formulation. And in order to get this to precisely reflect what's happening behind the scenes, what we need to do is to formally um, uh, settle upon what is the nominal injection, what is the participation factor, and what is the slack variable, all right? So we'll, we'll go back to the system architecture and I won't dig into all the details here recognizing the broad audience that we have with us today, but I'll try to give you a flavor for what those variables actually have to be. And it turns out that there's three key pieces of the picture or the puzzle that we have to keep in mind. There are these economic dispatch optimizers, right? So this is coming from your Google Maps trip planner. What you sort of hope that the trip is going to look like. You hope that you're going to be somewhere close to these optimum uh, operating points. Again, these are issued every five to 10 minutes. 
you're solving it with an estimate of the load. So if you look at this picture, you're solving it with these starred values of the load across the two areas, net load across the two areas, but it's going to be outdated by the time you get to real-time operation, but we'll kind of keep that on the side for now. All right, this is one key piece of the puzzle. The second key piece of the puzzle is what's happening on a real-time basis. What is your cruise control actually doing for you? And in the context of the power system, as I said, we're collecting real-time measurements of frequencies and flows on these key tie lines, which are scheduled out ahead based on bilateral contracts between different uh, utilities and system operators and so on. And what we do then is we get an estimate of the total net additional power that we need above and beyond what was accounted for in economic dispatch. And you want to have a means of allocating that net additional power on an area by area basis to all the generators that are in the system. So, and that, that has to be done in a fair means. And that's done with these participation factors. And these are, so when, when, you, when you kind of dig this out on a, on a, a, on a control theoretic uh, framework, these end up being feed forward gains. So these quantities, alphas one, two, three, and four are feed forward gains and they are numbers between zero and one. So if it's a number that's closer to one that tells you that you are going to be picking up a lot more of the net load and the losses that were not accounted for when you planned your trip, and if your number is, is, is somewhere close to zero, that means you're not going to be picking up as much of it. There's a whole history and a whole uh, technical conversation that can be had about the, the way that you determine these. They, you, know, you, can, you can get a sense that these are important and they absolutely are, but we won't get into that. And then on the physical layer side, as I said, you, know, you have the load that you thought is going to be the case. But of course, you come in, you turn the lights on and off, um, and, and, and then you don't really know what the load is going to be in a look ahead fashion. So you have this net load imbalance then on an area by area level basis, which you have to accom uh, accommodate for. And that's exactly what this AGC layer is doing. So we'll keep these three sort of pictures in mind. And, um, and, and, and we'll, we'll try, try to kind of think about what that means in the context of the power flow problem. And it turns out that the correct way to specify the power injections for all the generators is to piece all of these three pieces together and use that as the value of the real power that's going to be injected when you set up these network power balance equations. So the correct way to do this is to say that, all right, for each generator, I know that I'm going to be operating somewhere close to what my economic dispatch was telling me I should operate at, right? So this is coming every five to 10 minutes. However, it's already outdated by the time I go to, to sinusoidal steady state operation. So I need to have some sort of correction. And that correction is a combination of two things. It's these participation factors that come from my cruise control or my AGC. And I also have to respect the net load across uh, each of these areas. And now you see that generators one and two belong to one particular control area and generators three and four belong to the other control area. So the net load imbalance that generator one and two is, is picking up is just the net load imbalance or the net load and the losses that were not acknowledged in that particular area. So that's this superscript right here. And likewise for generators three and four, and the superscript here signifies that it's the net load imbalance for that particular area, all right? So when you, when you, when you collect all these nonlinear equations and you specify what the real power injections have to be, the right way to do it that respects economic dispatch, that respects AGC, that respects the operational layers of the power system, at time scales that are relevant to when the power flow problem is actually being solved for the for the voltages is this particular formulation. All right. So so let's take a look at when this is actually valid, right? So we talk about solving the power flow, but when is this whole thing valid? And what's shown here is a sketch of the system frequency between two instances of economic dispatch. Okay. So this is when you solve the problem once. And this is when you solve the problem again. As I said, this entire window is maybe on the order of five to 10 minutes. And you hope that the frequency is going to be close to 60 Hertz during that entire horizon. Okay, so that's, that's what we hope for. That's not actually always going to be the case, but that's what we hope for. What happens? What happens is every time you dispatch, you might have some fluctuations. You might have big signal, large signal changes in load that you never really saw coming. You don't have any means for correcting for it up until you redispatch the system. So this frequency might, might take, a, take a hit, but you have this entire control layer, cruise control that brings it back after settling 
based based on the different layers of control that you have, or up to 60 hertz again. So every time you are in this gray area, this is synchronous steady state. This is 60 hertz operation. Although there are other periods of steady state uh, that that come about as a result of the complex nonlinear dynamics that we have at play behind the scenes. So it turns out that every time I look at steady state operation. Okay, and this is not just sinusoidal steady state. Every time I look at steady state operation, the precise equations that I have uh, to solve for my voltages across the network are exactly given in this particular form. Okay, where the power outputs of generators can precisely be written in this particular format. Uh, a nominal value and uh, a fraction of this net load that I'm picking up across different generators. And this is true whether you're operating at 60 hertz or away from it, and waiting to get back to 60 hertz. Okay, so every time you have steady state, it is in fact true that these uh, that, the, that the power flow equations precisely take this particular form uh, for real power injections, and the generator injections can precisely be written in this particular way. It just so turns out that when you have synchronous steady state operation, so when you are just looking at 60 hertz operation, there is one and only one way of specifying the power injection for the generators. And that's what I just impressed upon you a few slides back. So if you're looking at 60 hertz operation, the right way that makes sense, that's, um, that, that, that sort of meshes with the steady state operation of this whole architecture is one where nominal injection respects what's happening at this very slow time scale, what we call tertiary control, economic dispatch. So it has to be the case that this PG not is coming from my dispatch optimization. The participation factors are coming from this middle layer, the secondary control layer, the cruise control layer, automatic generation control, the feed forward games that, that we talked about. And this slack variable, it has to be the net load imbalance on an area by area level, depending on which area the generator belong to. So when you set up the problem in this particular way and you solve for the voltages, it so turns out that the solution of the voltages to this formulation of the power flow problem are most closely aligned with how the whole system operates and how it's uh, from a temporal point of view and how it's built up from a spatial point of view. So this is the way that you have to solve the problem uh, if you want to get the most accurate uh, value of, of voltages and phase angles in sinusoidal uh, steady state, which we hope is the 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 the, the the, the operating regime that the, the, the power system would be uh, in, 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 uh, for, for a majority of the time. Although there are these periods of time when there are uh, uh, nudges away from that, from that synchronous steady state operation. All right, so uh, I'm gonna just you know, uh, close out this technical piece of this conversation with just a few very quick simulation results. Uh, here's a very quick uh, sketch uh, of, of, of the so-called New England IEEE test case system. There's a bunch of generators here, a bunch of loads, a uh, few transmission lines. We are going to artificially divvy it up into two control areas. We'll have three generators at the top control area, seven at the bottom. Just our sketch for, for how the system operates on a, on a broader scale. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a very detailed, uh, it turns out that there's a differential algebraic equation model that goes behind the scenes. If you don't want to look at these, uh, you know, sinusoidal steady state snapshots in order to solve for everything that's going on, if you want to actually simulate this and be as close as possible to representing and acknowledging all the dynamics, you have to run this very detailed simulation. So we have a very detailed generator model. We have lossy lines. We have all the integrity details that we throw into this into the simulation, and that establishes ground truth for us in in, in validating this uh, this particular distributed flag approach. Uh, and we're going to use the distributed flag uh, power flow solution, and we're going to compare it with the traditional way of doing things, right? Which is in your uh, junior course power systems textbooks, which is the single slack version. And now you get to one of the reasons why the single slack version actually does not um, uh, is, is kind of difficult to to, uh, to 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 set up. Which generator are you going to pick as your slack bus, right? And it turns out that in this particular case, if you want to do it exhaustively, you have a total of 21 different operations or uh, 21 different uh, combinations uh, that 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 you have to compare against. Okay, because in each of these control areas, you could have picked any one of these three generators at the top. In this bottom one, you could have picked any of the seven. So three times seven gives you 21 different options to pick out the single flag bus if you were solving the power flow problem as it was formulated back in the 50s. All right. 
All right, so we'll compare both of these and we'll compare it against, as I said, a very detailed DAE model. And the way we'll show you the results uh, are, are these box and whisker plots. And I'm gonna use this to tell you what these box and whisker plots actually are. I'm sure you've seen all of these uh, in, in, in many different contexts, right? You, you see them in the popular press sometimes, but what actually is happening in these box and whisker plots? Okay, so this is how I will show you a few of the simulation results that we have. And every time you see a box and whisker plot after this talk, you'll know what, what's going on. So when I focus on this box and whisker, the, uh, there's, a, there's a dash that goes through the box and that's the median of the data that you're collecting. Uh, the <clears throat> ends of the whiskers are the minimum and maximum values, right? And then the, the length of the box or the width of the box, however you want uh, to position your neck, is, ex is essentially capturing the data in the first and third quarters. And again, this is a very fancy word that statisticians throw around. It just tells you that this is around 90% of all the data that you have that you're collecting. All right, so that's what I'm going to show. And these are all going to be errors that I that I show you. I'll just show you two results, but they're all going to be errors. And uh, they're going to be errors, as I said, for comparing the distributed slack. So this was this version of the power flow problem that I presented, and that's going to be my case zero. And I'm going to compare that, compare it with the with the ground truth. That's my detailed simulation of everything that's going on. Uh, when I and, and, and I'll do that with respect to all the possible options that I had for my single slack choices. And in this particular case, as I said, there's 21 of them. Okay, so there's going to be a total of um, 21 options that I'm going to compare against my my distributed slack version of the power flow. And there's two axes here. The the stuff on the left is the version of the power flow problem that I'm that I'm promoting. Uh, the axis on the right is going to be the plain vanilla version of doing it. And then uh, here are the results that we have. Okay, I'm going to show you two results. There's a paper that has many more. Here is the result that shows you the error in the voltage phase angle. And you can immediately appreciate that no matter which version of the single slack power flow that you were solving, we get an order of magnitude improvement with this distributed slack. So it's, it's definitely much more aligned with what happens in real time when you do simulate all the dynamics of the generators when you do respect all the operational aspects that are going on behind the scenes with respect to the power system. And you can definitely appreciate that orders of magnitude improvement that you get when you solve the problem. And, it, and I must tell you that it, it takes no more additional computational burden. It's just acknowledging what's happening behind the scenes and specifying those generator outputs, right? And we get similar results even when you look at, let's say something like blind flow errors, so these are all the flows on the transmission lines. Again, you see sort of an orders of magnitude improvement in terms of quantifying what those line flows should be when you do it with this distributed slack bus version of the power flow versus the version uh, that, that, that we all have, have, um, uh, have, have, been, have, have grown up with, which is the single slack version. All right, so I'm gonna end this, this sort of uh, the third quarter of, of my presentation here, having presented the history and having presented the power flow problem and a revised way of looking at the whole picture. And I'm gonna point you to a book that allowed us to put a lot of these pieces of the puzzle together. And again, as I said, if you wanna know about Nikola Tesla uh, and, 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 and uh, Edison, you know, there's enough movies, there's enough books that, that's been written about that piece of it. But here's one that looks at how the grid was actually interconnected. It's a fascinating look at what happened behind the scenes. It's written by a very famous historian at the University of Houston. Her name is Judy Cohn. And if that last name sounds familiar, it's because it just so ends up being that she is Nathan Cohn's daughter. Okay, so imagine that she saw her dad put this whole system together. She was right there when he was, you know, busy kind of doing this on the ground. And after all of these years, I think this book was maybe published just a couple of years ago, she was able to kind of put all of these pieces of the puzzle together and fill in this very important gap in the history of electrification between what we know and love about the, the battle of the currents and what we have in terms of the operation of the electrical power system as it stands today. So I'd highly recommend this. All right, so I'm gonna end with, with a view towards the future. Uh, and you, know, you might say, all right, all of this conversation was centered around synchronous generators, it was centered around the power system as it stands today. What happens going forward? So as we think about the power system and all its operational layers as they exist today, 
you have many different things spanning sub-seconds all the way to decades, right? That's the time scale at which these systems are actually planned. And if you think about the ongoing transition in the power system where you're replacing a few generators with lots of electronic energy conversion interfaces called inverters, what's going to happen is the time scales are going to shrink. In addition to endowing this power system with an attribute of being much more distributed in, in, in structure and operation, the time scales themselves are going to shrink. Okay, so whether it's control, whether it's dispatch, these are the two sort of aspects that we looked at today. There's also scheduling and planning and a lot of other things. All of these things are going to shrink. There's also going to be a very broad mix of generators and inverters and inverters of many different types. You have grid forming inverters, grid following inverters, you have inter inverters that are interfacing PV, inverters that are interfacing energy storage, inverters that are interfacing electric vehicles. And these inverters, as they stand today, there's limited participation of them across the different operational layers of the power system, but that's going to change in a very fundamental way going ahead. So they will be participating in secondary control, industry control, they will be dispatched, they will be receiving frequency regulation signals, very similar to the architecture that we have uh, presented for generators today. And the time scales themselves are going to be fundamentally different, right? So we spent a little bit of time thinking about synchronous operation, what that means, you know, five to 10 minutes, two to four seconds, all of those things are going to change going ahead. And the very notion I contend of synchronous operation itself will have to be redefined. What does it mean for the system to be at 60 Hertz? Is it ever going to be at 60 Hertz? Or what horizons do we have to actually redefine our understanding of when control actions have to be effective and so on? So our vision for the future is something that looks like this. It's an ongoing uh, DOE Solar Energy Technologies Office project that's being led by Professor Brian Johnson over at, over at UW. Um, and, and we also have Bowsen and Daniel on the team. And here's our mock-up, here's our vision for, for what the future power system may look like. And of course, this may not be true across all aspects and at all power levels, but we do see a significant uh, integration of the so-called grid forming inverters. There's gonna be a role for the, the, the types of inverters that exist today, which are called grid following, but the whole picture is going to change in the sense that there's going to be a massive integration of these electronic interfaces across transmission and distribution layers of the power system. There's gonna be communication. Really, we, we see this as a period of immense flux. And what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that as we approach this future power system, we revisit the classical power flow problem and align it with the ongoing and anticipated transitions, which then respect this power grid to be one that's entirely or increasingly built on circuits. And in doing so, we don't lag behind our academic formulation of the power flow problem, how it's solved, how it's formulated, much like what happened in the 50s and the 70s, right? So this is where I do think that there's going to be a means and an opportunity for getting power systems and power electronics engineers together and recognize that the future is going to be one where the boundaries between these two domain areas uh, is, is, is not entirely um, is, is not entirely obvious. And of course you have controls and optimization that comes into the picture as well. So this is just a plea for having the formulations of academic problems as we know and we formulate and we solve and we teach to be aligned with where the industry is, is heading. So uh, with that, I'm going to end and, and pause for questions uh, if there's any from the audience. Thank you so much. All right, thanks so much, Sairaj. That was fantastic.